Hello, and welcome to the Silicon Alley Podcast. Today's episode, we'll be talking about leadership. Specifically, we'll talk about seven steps that you can take today to become a more effective leader. In addition, we will talk about some of the ways that you can secure your business. Christian Espinoza, the founder of Alpine Security, joins us. He's also the author of The Smartest Person in the Room, where he talks about the secure methodology that helps you become a more effective leader. If you're not already, go ahead and pound that subscribe button so you get notified when episodes air of the Silicon Alley podcast every Friday. I'm William Glass, CEO and co-founder of Ostrich, and of course, your host. Without further ado, I hope you enjoy this leadership-focused episode of the Silicon Alley podcast featuring the Christian Espinoza. You got no time to waste, but still you hesitate. Caught in a Christian, welcome to the Silicon Alley podcast. Super excited to have you on today. Yeah, thanks, William. I'm excited to be on Silicon Alley. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah. And um, I'm really excited to dive into a few things here. Obviously, the security background is really, really interesting. And you've written a new book that I definitely want to want to dive into. But I think a great place to kind of start the conversation is taking a, a, a big step back to mm-hmm. your childhood and how that kind of impacted your story, because you didn't grow up in necessarily the most uh, ideal situation for for a child. So would you would you mind giving your background? I grew up in, uh, like you said, not the ideal scenario. I don't know if anybody really grows up in, you know, this ideal scenario. We've all got issues in our childhood. Uh, my, child, my childhood was very chaotic. Um, and the, the chaos really um, helped me in a number of ways. It helped me deal with uncertainty quite a bit. Uh, just as an example from my childhood, uh, like one day I was coming home from kindergarten, walking home, and... I, I heard this really loud music uh, coming from my house. Uh, this was in California. This is when people still walk to school, actually. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, I knew it was Bob Dylan. So I knew if like Bob Dylan was playing loudly, uh, so loud I could hear it like when I c- turned the corner on the, the neighborhood street, that I, I knew something was awry with my mother. My mother was addicted to pain, pain meds and, and a few other things. Uh, so when I came home, uh, my mom collected these glass eggs. She was really like kind of a hippie and, the, and she had these cool, colorful glass eggs and she had taken them and we had like 10 aquariums too. She liked aquariums. And for some reason, she took all the glass eggs and threw them in all the aquariums and threw them in all the pictures in the house, which had glass picture frames. And I'm like, you know, six or something, whatever kindergarten ages. And um, I come into the house and there's like glass on the floor and there's water and there's like fish like you know, flopping on the glass in the floor. So it's like a really weird scene, right? Um, But that was kind of normal for my childhood is to experience things like that. And whenever I experienced that though, I I would go, I didn't like it. You know, I didn't feel good about that. that. So I would go like in the hills behind my house and hang out in nature by myself. And I really like kind of become like uh, centered and grounded when I go to nature to get away from that sort of a chaotic environment. Yeah, that's really got to be be challenging, but it sounds like you were able to at least find a way to find calm in your life by using nature. Can you talk a little bit about like how that impacted your overall trajectory? One, building a, your own cybersecurity company and this practice in cybersecurity, um, but just what were some of the impact of those early, those early days as you um, kind of grew up and uh, started to, to come into your, your own? The, the early days like shaped me, right? And I used to have a lot of resentment about it until I did a lot of personal development, a lot of deep inner work. And I realized that what I went through as a, as a child, you know, mm-hmm. um, albeit not ideal per se, but it made me who I am. Yeah. So being able to deal with the uncertainty, which you, you have a lot when, when you start a business, uh, you know, the ups and downs, and it's, it's quite chaotic. Uh, that was... Um, easier for me because I grew up with it, you know, so like relative wise, it wasn't that big a deal. And then that, um, we moved to Arkansas when I was like 12 and, and, um, that's the scenario when my mom kind of got worse. So it also gave me a drive to get out of the scenario. I didn't want to be in that environment. And so I had a taste of it and it gave me like a fuel to get out of that environment and also maybe want to crave certainty and significance. So that led me to want to achieve more so people wouldn't um, 
you know, look at me as the, the poor kid from the messed up family. So I wanted to prove everybody wrong. So it actually gave me a lot of drive and ambition to, to do more, really. Yeah. Yeah. And I, th I think you, you talk about this kind of right in the book, wanting to be the best at everything, <laughs> wanting to, uh, you know, kind of prove yourself. And I, th I think you use some sort of uh, term around like shaping other people or like shaping the scenario to, so to your benefit, right? Can you talk a little bit about, about that and how that drive, um, like that drive that was instilled, as you said, to not be the poor kid um, from the messed up family? Yeah, it's, it's interesting uh, because that my childhood gave me the drive. It gave me uh, my love of nature. I still love nature. I like to go outside and hike. I like to walk. I like to climb mountains. You know, I like to be outdoors. And that, a lot of that came from my childhood because I wanted to escape, sort of. Uh, but what I talk about in the book is, and, I, and I, I, it took me a long time to realize this, I went to a, a thing called the Landmark Forum. And so it's a personal development event. I've done a lot of personal development events. Um, but at that one, something clicked a little bit differently because I used to have resentment for my childhood and resentment towards my mom. But what I realized is, that wasn't serving me, that, that, that meaning I attached to my childhood. So when you take a step back and disassociate from life or whatever's going on in your life, your experiences, they don't have an intrinsic meaning. The meaning is whatever you attach to that. So then I shifted my meaning and attached like the stuff we've been talking about that my childhood was actually very beneficial because it gave me the drive uh, being able to deal with uncertainty, liking nature. There's a lot of positive gifts that came out of it. Yeah. And I think any scenario, if you think about it, there's something you can take away from it. But we tend to, as humans, attach like some negative, like why, th why did this happen to me? Or woe is me meaning, but that doesn't serve us. It holds us back. Yeah. Christian, that's a really great point, right? You know, figuring out what our own narrative is, right? Because you rewrote your own narrative, essentially, as to how you were going to look at your childhood and how you were framing that in your own mind, as you said, because it wasn't originally serving you. Yeah. What was that process like? You, you mentioned going to a couple different, doing a lot of um, personal development. And um, can you talk about that process? Because I think that that's something really critical. Because, I mean, everyone in their own experience has their own sort of so to speak, demons, right? Or their own mm -hmm. narrative that they're trying to overcome. Can you talk a little bit about how you, how you got to the place where you are today and have reframed that, um, your childhood? It, it was a, a journey and it still is a journey. I think we're all dealing with some underlying trauma, especially, you know, I've, I've read some study, like, I think it's like 80% of entrepreneurs have some childhood trauma that they're dealing with. And and, and it, it manifests by them working really hard and want to build something to prove, prove their worth to the world, sort of, right? Yeah. So we've all got this, this trauma. And for me, it was, um, it was a long journey. I, I, I read Tony Robbins a really long time ago. But it was really when I started going to these events. And I would go to the events. And I, was, I used to be on the periphery. I, I would like not view myself as a participant, but as sort of a spectator. Mm -hmm. And... I wasn't really transforming because of that. So that landmark forum event uh, was one of the first ones. And it was, I was so uncomfortable. I felt like leaving. I, I almost left in the first break because I don't, you know, I, I'm not naturally inclined to share vulnerabilities or things with strangers. But what, what the way to, to transform is to realize we all have, we've all had broken childhoods. We've all had messed up things happen in our lives. And that's the thing that makes us, you know, human. And, and it's a commonality among us to, to share that and talk it out and get comfortable with that helps you heal and helps you reframe uh, the meaning really. Because when you talk to, to other people, you realize like, you know, you're not the only one that's had these things happen. You're not the only, you know, other people had way worse things happen. And you can see in these events, the people that are being held back, it's all in their mind. It's the meaning they attach to the scenario. So like it's a landmark form and, and watching people transform and how they shifted, uh, you know, what they believed about a certain event or a thing that happened to them was very powerful. And it made me realize that, you know, we have the power to change what things mean to us. And it, why not pick something that serves you? Yeah. Yeah. 
No, I, I love that, Christian. That's a really interesting stat too. What you said, over 80% of entrepreneurs have some sort of trauma that, you, that they're going through. I wasn't familiar with that at all. That's, uh, it doesn't surprise me now that you say it, but I just you know, wouldn't have thought that it was that high. Yeah, I was at a, a Genius Network event. I think they said 70 or 80%. It may have been 90, but it was, a, it was a really high number. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So from that lens, can you, can you talk about where this, as you were going through this kind of um, uh, personal development, where were you in your career, right? Because you, uh, as the book says, smartest person in the room, you kind of went through this phase as an individual contributor and really wanting to be the smartest person in the room. So can you kind of talk about that and how that blended into your entrepreneurial journey? I, I had kind of dabbled in personal development and you know, improving myself and self-improvement and all that for, for many years. Uh, and I had this job where I was a VP for a company and it was kind of kind of a defining moment for me where I was like physically stressed out and feeling like ill and, and just, I wasn't sleeping well and I was making a good salary, but it made me realize that, uh, you know, whatever money I'm making is not in, important enough for my health, right? So I don't want to like be stressed out and, and to make more money and prove this or that. So it's like the first time I ever quit a job without having a, another job lined up because my sanity and my health meant that much to me. And that, when I did that, that sort of started me on more of a like, you know what, I have to figure this out because I didn't have another job lined up. I decided I needed to be more resourceful. And I became an independent contractor and did freelance work for like five years. And during that freelance journey is really when uh, I started like because I had more time mm -hmm. so, you know, as a freelancer. So I, I went to more events and started like figuring out really what I wanted to do in my life. And, and, and this is a new stepping stone because I went from, you know, an employee to a freelancer. And then I decided, you know what, the way to get the most personal growth is to start a business because I will have to figure things out in order to succeed. So this is like, it drives necessity. And it's one of the most uh, challenging things there is with people and processes. And I'm a believer that with a business, um, the business is a reflection of the owner or the CEO. Yeah. So the business is not doing well. There's something wrong with whoever's running the business. Uh, you know, that's a reflection of them. It's a mirrored back at you. So that really uh, cranked up my uh, need to get better as a human. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. So you, yeah, you got to the point in your career where you, you no longer were measuring the barometer of success by a title or money, it was, how do I feel? And what's my experience and starting to prioritize the health and mental health and all those things that, you know, I think we're finally kind of coming to this point, at least in terms of talking about entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship. And, yeah. and beyond that, I guess it's just in general in society where there is this focus again on health and mental health and the importance of that in our lives towards happiness and fulfillment. Ultimately, it boils down to how we feel about things, right? We can make all the money we want or have the titles, like you said, but if we don't feel good or congruent with who we are, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's very, very powerful, Christian. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's safe to say then that you were not seeking to be an entrepreneur. It wasn't like, one of the story of you were hawking uh, like, you know, newspapers at the age of seven and candy and all that. It's not that kind of story, right? Your entrepreneurial journey is a little different. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not, not like I was born always wanted to, to run a business or start a business. You know, I, I didn't have that mindset, but what I did, when I did freelance work uh, for like five years, I, I made more money than I'd ever made. I had more free time than I'd ever had. And, and, you know, I'd work like six or eight months and take a few months off of vacation. And I was living a, a good life, but I felt kind of like selfish and empty. Uh, I felt like, you know what, this, this life I'm living is not serving anyone other than me really. And I, and I want to sh shift our industry and create something bigger than myself. And I want to take what I've learned and, and put it into my company as a, you know, as a culture, core values, and, and help serve, 
you know, our clients differently than they've been served before. So it really was, you know, a journey from like freelance work to me became sort of status quo and selfish. And I thought, what's the next thing I can do? It's like, oh, I can start a business, hire people, develop them and serve our clients. So that will require me to up my skills Mm -hmm. and I'll be contributing at a higher level. Yeah, it's yeah, really interesting that you got to that point, right? Because there's a lot of uh, a, a lot of I would say talk in certain certain circles when it comes to entrepreneurship. There's different different flavors, so to speak, right? Mm-hmm. Your digital nomadi type, <laughs> um, you know, kind of uh, which sounds like you hit the you had the dream, right? Like you could had more free time, you could take months off, you were making more money, yeah. yet feeling unfulfilled because it was only serving yourself. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I was living that digital nomad life. Uh, and I, I just, it, w- it was great for a long time for like, you know, four years that the whole fifth year or so I just started, you know, kind of aching for more and feeling selfish. Like I said, like there's something yeah. else I should be doing. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about Alpine security in the business and how you created it, brought on the team. Like t- talk to me a little bit about having to up your skill set to step into this entrepreneurial role and being able to give back in a way that, uh, that you weren't getting from the, the freelance work that you were doing. Yeah, I started Alpine Security in 2014 and I actually sold it here in December of, of this past December uh, of 2020. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. So uh, my company is a wholly owned, wholly owned subsidiary now uh, by Cerberus Sentinel. Uh, but the, 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 the whole journey, for, for me, I thought it'd be simple. I thought, you know what? I'm really good at figuring things out. Uh, I, I was a very successful freelancer. Why can't I just start a business, hire people, make tons of money? Uh, and and I'll, you know, that's what I thought initially. And I was like dead wrong. It was not easy at all. Uh, from the, the first, you know, from the very first day, the first person I hired, there was personnel issues because I didn't know how to hire people right. That, you know, but 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 the thing is, um, cash. There was cash flow issues, or all all the issues you could imagine with a small business. And and like I talked about the uncertainty before, uh, with my childhood, I think that served me in my business because there is a lot of uncertainty when you start a business. Uh, you're uncertain if a client's going to pay you on time. Uh, you know, if you can have enough cash to make payroll. There's all these things you got to deal with. And for me, uh, I kept in mind that. You know, if I if I make a mistake here, as long as I correct it or make progress on correcting it for the next time, then I'll I'll learn something in the process, mm-hmm. and I'll become better. Uh, and that's just what I had to keep telling myself, because, you know, and, and sometimes it, I I made the same mistake twice, yeah. or even three times. I paid you know the the dumb tax as they say, <laughs> and um, like with hiring people, you know, I I, I would hire somebody because they were really like intellectually brilliant, but horrible with people. And that did not go well with our prospects, with clients, with my team. So then I thought, you know what, I'm going to shape my core values. So I wrote core values for a company uh, and I changed my hiring process to fix that. And as soon as you fix that, you know, there's something else that happens, right? There's this, the sales are are down or the marketing is not going well. So there's always something to solve. And the way I look at it is like, if you have all these dials on your dashboard, if you turn one of them up, it seems like when you own a business, like two, two other ones turn down. Like you can't turn them all <laughs> up at once because you focus on one, something else suffers. You're always like running back and forth almost. Um, but yeah, that uncertainty, uh, I just looked at a way to continuously improve and get better. Yeah. And this does this go back to, as you were talking about earlier, childhood, that drive to prove that, you know, you, you were worth something, right? Is, is that where you think this drive to continually challenge yourself and learn new things comes from? For me, I, I think it may have came from there, but I believe as, as humans, we, we value progress. We sometimes forget that, but at least for me, and I think most people, when, when we're progressing in life, you know, in any aspect of life, we feel happier. Like, you know, if, if we had, if we're making, if somebody was making less money today as an employee than they made 10 years ago, they probably wouldn't feel too good about themselves, right? Yeah. But if you're continually improving and increasing your salary or increasing your, you know, ability to, uh, you know, fish better or whatever you're doing, um, 
we tend to feel better about ourselves when we're making progress. So I, I don't, I think it was really for me, I value growth and I value contribution. I had kind of shifted away from certainty and significance to growth and contribution. And that gave me fulfillment. Now I'm not always happy. You know, when you have a business, there's a lot of stress, uh, but it, it, I felt like I'm, I'm part of something bigger. You know, I, I'm shaping an organization, uh, the people in my organization, my clients, and I'm impacting people at a bigger level. So yeah. me, it was, it was really about the, the growth and contribution. Yeah. No, thanks. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. Because I think you're, you're spot on there, Christian, when it comes to us as humans wanting to have progress and goes back to like, you know, the, the way that our brain reacts and chemicals that get triggered mm-hmm. as we make progress and all that kind of stuff, the reward centers. So I, yeah, it's, it's a, a really great point that you make that it's that uh, might have partially to do with your, your background, but more so probably to do with just the fact that you're, that you're a human. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, you mentioned this uh, hiring mistake of wanting to hire high IQ people that maybe weren't really good with clients, prospects, maybe even other employees. And this gets to kind of the crux of what you start to uncover in the book. Mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit about this high IQ, low EQ um, kind of scenario and what you've learned when it comes to working with this type of individual? Yeah, that's a great question, William. <laughs> so the high, in my industry, which is cybersecurity, uh, it's almost accepted that if you have a high IQ, like you're super smart with technology, with computers, with programming, then uh, it's okay if you have a low EQ or no EQ. So you don't even have to have any people skills. And the the problem is uh, we've tolerated this so long in cybersecurity and other tech industries that we've created this like toxic culture uh, where we've, and we've reinforced the stereotype. We've, We've allowed people to treat people, you know, in a, in a bad manner because they're super smart intellectually. And the, one of the hiring mistakes I made was I hired a guy who was probably one of the smartest guys I knew, you know, IQ wise. Uh, and I thought, because he said, I, I really want to, you know, get better at, with people and all this, he, he said that. So I thought he would be willing to make those, those shifts, but he wasn't willing to make those shifts. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he caused a lot of problems in my organization uh, and he would even brag about it. He would even say, you know what, I'm smarter than those people. So I, I get to walk all over them. That was like one of the things he told me um, after I hired him. I'm like, what? Like, why do you, because you're, you, you think you're smarter than someone you can treat them like this. That doesn't make any sense, but that is the attitude. Not everybody. There's, there's great people out there, but a lot of people have the attitude. Uh, and it really shift made me like flip my script when I hired people. So yeah. right now, I look for people that are cultural fit. Uh, they, they, they meet our core values. They believe in what we believe in. They're aligned with our purpose. If they meet all that first and they're good people, then I'll look at their technical skills. Before though, I used to look at their technical skills first and then look at the other stuff last. Mm-hmm. So I had to like learn the hard way and, and make that, you know, that flip, flipping that, that hiring, uh, you know, priority over basically. Yeah. No, it's a really interesting perspective because if you think about the way that we we traditionally hire, right? You think about get the resume, make sure they, you know, meet criteria, let's check their skill set, and then let's see if they're a good fit for the culture and the team. Um, whereas you flip to the script on that as you said. Mhm. So, yeah. If you and the thing is, you can have the best person on paper, uh, the best credentials, but if they're not a good fit for your culture and your core values, it's going to just cause all sorts of problems that you, you, you may not be able to pinpoint them, but you can feel them. If you really listen to your gut and, and uh, you know, your instincts, you, you, you know, something is wrong, um, but you're like, well, this person is really good. So why, you know, you, you just know something's awry. So it's, like I said, it's better to hire for the, the cultural fit and everything else first. Yeah. So that kind of gets, so you've kind of hit on the point of like how to avoid that in the, during the hiring process. But what if you've got an individual that is like that already on the team? What do you do? How do you, how do you approach that? that that's uh, not always an easy uh, scenario. Uh, you can do a performance improvement plan. I believe in having a very transparent conversation. Nobody should be 
um, surprised if they get let go or they're fired. You should have a conversation with them and say, look, and I've had to have this with people before as well, say, you know, there's, here's our core values and here's where you, you're meeting those and here's where you're not. And the challenge arises if you don't have core values or what you believe in as an organization defined because then you ha don't have something to measure somebody against uh, culturally. So when, when people in my organization didn't meet those core values, like ownership was one of them, mm -hmm. if somebody always had an excuse like, you know, so-and-so did this or this happened, that's not ownership. So I would have a discussion with them like, look, we believe in ownership. Here's several scenarios you're not taking ownership. And if, if that was a repeat thing, like three times, uh, we just had to let them go. As much as, you know, I wanted to initially, I kept thinking, uh, you know, because I wanted to take ownership myself. I kept thinking, I need to be able to help these people transform. My, you know, my, my staff transform from here to here. Uh, and I was making that attempt at, at the sacrifice of, of, of my organization as a whole and me. So you, you can only go so far, but the, the person doesn't want to change, they're not going to change. So I started um, having those transparent discussions and giving them chances to change, but if there was no improvement that I would let them go. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, I, I think it's it's important to highlight, you know, that you would want you want to work with folks, right? Like you, you brought them onto the team for a reason and being able to have that conversation because you know, no one should be surprised when they are let go, as you, as you said, right. That's, that's right. That's um, obviously important because you're, you, you know, you brought them on for a reason and you want to see them grow. And if you truly do care about the team, then you want obviously want to give them every opportunity to meet those goals and change. Right. Cause I think that's an important part, as you said, it's growth and progression as, as people, we want to continue to grow and, and get better. Yeah. And not everybody wants to, to grow, uh, like, and this is, this is a, a, a paradigm shift I, I had to have as well. I used to believe, you know, why is it, why aren't people like me? Why don't they want to improve this or do that? Or, you know, go climb mountains or go <laughs> skydive or whatever. But the reality is everyone's different. You can't expect people to be like you. And I used to get frustrated because people didn't want to, you know, they didn't want to embrace a growth mindset yeah. and that's okay, but they're just not a good fit for my organization, for instance. Um, so you just have to accept that, you know, it's okay that, these people aren't the, the way you expect them to be, but they're, they're just not a good fit for you. They're probably great over here doing something else. Yeah, no, that's a great way to look at it. Great way to look at it for sure. So can you talk to me a little bit about, um, in the book, you talk about the seven step secure methodology. Can you talk a little bit about what that is, why it's important and how you kind of developed it and, and share a little bit more about that? Over the years of my company, Alpine Security, those uh, from 2014 to 2020, uh, you know, roughly almost six years, I had a lot of challenges with my staff. You know, we did cybersecurity, we did penetration testing, which is ethical hacking or white hat hacking. So it's a highly technical skill. And I was in a meeting uh, once and one of my team members said that the client just didn't get it. That's what they said. They just don't get it. And and I, don't, and I I don't know what it was about that specific meeting, but it 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 like hit me differently. And I and I because I was the owner of the business, you know, and the CEO. I'm running the business. I funded the business, and I, and maybe it's because of that context, but it hit me differently. I'm thinking these are my clients. If if they're not getting it, they're not going to be able to you know patch their systems or understand the risks we're trying to explain to them. They have to get it. So that sort of started me on this journey of realizing that my team was, you know, trying to be the smartest person in the room. Uh, they were talking over clients' heads. They weren't sharing things internally because for, for fear of feeling stupid. And then I looked back on my whole career and I realized that throughout my career, this was a common problem. And it was a problem with me too. I used to do these same things and just say, yeah, management just doesn't understand. Um, but for some reason I was at a different point in my life and I decided you know, I need to do something about this. Uh, this is my business. I didn't start a business to be status quo uh, and to be like everybody else. So I did a lot of training with my team, a lot of EQ training, uh, soft skills training, productivity training, client interaction training, uh, awareness training, um, just a lot of training that ended up 
um, becoming through trial and error, those seven steps or the secure methodology I, I wrote about in the book. Gotcha. Yeah. So that makes sense. Yeah. Wanting to get over that smartest person in the room syndrome, so to speak. Can you lay out what are, what are the seven steps? Yeah, the seven steps and they're in order. Uh, and I call it the secure methodology because I believe a lot of the smartest people or the people that are pretending to be the smartest people in the room, I believe that that comes from insecurity. So if you're secure within yourself and you're certain within yourself, you'll be okay not knowing everything, right? So the seven steps address that. Um, but the first step is awareness. So if you're not aware that your model of the world is different than somebody else's model of the world, uh, you're gonna be constantly frustrated. You're not gonna alter your communication, uh, for instance. That's just one part of it. There's also, also like blind spots. Okay. We all have these blind spots and we all have these triggers that we don't know about. So I talk about uh, NLP or neuro linguistic programming in the book quite a bit. And what happens is if somebody says something or somebody does something, this program kicks off on our brain and we just automatically start reacting a certain way. So having the awareness to like do a pattern interrupt or control C and stop <laughs> that is extremely important. So that's step one. Uh, step two <laughs> is mindset. So I talk about a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset and do a, you know, some comparison with the red pill and the blue pill of the matrix. But basically in order for you to develop EQ skills, you need to have a, a growth mindset. Uh, which means that your skills are not, and your traits are not just like the way they are. They're, they're malleable and you can refine them or, or take on new qualities. Because a lot of people would say, I'm just not good with people. That's a belief mm -hmm. that, and you can totally change that, right? And that's an identity that's, that, you know, is, is enforced by your ego, typically. Uh, the third one is acknowledgement. Uh, so with me, as a, as a leader, I, I've always struggled with self-acknowledgement. So if I can't acknowledge myself, I'm, not, I'm gonna have a hard time acknowledging my team. The most highly technical people, uh, they worked really hard on their technical skills. So they need mm -hmm. to be acknowledged for that. Uh, the fourth step is communication, which is a massive topic. Uh, but one of the NLP presuppositions I'm a big fan of is that the meaning of communication is the response you get. So if you're talking to somebody and they're doing something different than you quote communicated to them, you didn't explain it well enough. Yeah. Or if you're talking to that client that just doesn't get it, is that the outcome you wanted going into the conversation for them not to get it, right? That's probably not the outcome you wanted. <laughs> so you need to change how you're communicating. Yeah. Uh, and same thing like with relationships or anything really. So I talked a lot about ways to improve that. And uh, the fifth step, is uh, monotasking. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, multitaskers out there. I'm very anti-multitasking. I, I think concentrated effort and focused effort, you can get much more done. And the steps you know, relate to each other as well, because if you're communicating with somebody, but you're on your cell phone or you're checking your, your Slack, then you're not present and you're not listening very well. So you know, they tie together. Um, the sixth step is empathy. So it's important to have empathy. I think because the media and, you know, all the stuff we hear all the time, we, we tend to focus, focus on our differences. Uh, we, you know, like we, 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 we even have labels for our differences. Like, you know, I'm an engineer, that's management. You know, I'm an Apple person, you know, she's a Microsoft person. We put all these labels, mm -hmm. which, you know, make everybody seem different. But like I mentioned earlier, Fundamentally, we're all humans and we share a lot of, of things in common. So it's hard to be an effective leader or have an effective team when you're only looking at the differences. And then the seventh step is Kaizen, which is constant and never ending improvement. Uh, so the journey to mastery uh, is, a, is a long journey. You never really master anything. So you're going to have some valleys in there because you have to unlearn some stuff. Yeah. So understanding that you know, as you're trying to improve, you're, you make it worse or, and it's not going to be an overnight thing is extremely important with this uh, framework, this methodology. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I, I like, I like how you've set it up, Christian. Thanks for, for walking through the seven steps. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Sorry, it took a little bit of time there, but you know. no, 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 you're good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, they're all important. So I'm, I'm trying to think in terms of how someone would apply this, could you give, could you kind of give an example of um, how, how someone could use this information to benefit themselves or their organization? Sure. So the, the, the methodology, if, if you're a leader, uh, you know, part of leadership is leading yourself. So if you go through the methodology yourself, you'll understand your own behavior, your own model of the world, your own belief system, your own identity, how you communicate, you know, all these things will, will improve for you. Cause I have activities in the book as well to support each of the uh, steps. Okay. These things should improve for you. And then once you've improved, you can uh, help your team develop as well. Uh, so it starts with the, you know, the individual. Uh, and this could be, you know, we're all leaders in some capacity. You don't have to be a leader of a company. Uh, you know, you, you could be leading you know, your family or leading your children or leading in a moment with your friends. It doesn't matter, but these skills will serve you. Um, so the awareness is a, is a, you know, that's why I start with awareness, because you have to have awareness of, you know, how you show up matters. If you show up in a bad mood and bring bad energy to your, your group of friends, the, the energy level is going to drop, right? So how you show up matters and that awareness of how you show up matters. And these things like, you know, the awareness of uh, that we've all got, you know, specific patterns in our brain that run, uh, you know, based on a trigger and how to change that. All this awareness is extremely important. And that's just the first step. Gotcha. Yeah, no, no. I, yeah, I appreciate you sharing. Cause I think, yeah, that awareness is obviously key, right? Cause you can't, it doesn't matter <laughs> the rest of them. You can't really do very well if you're not aware of where you are today and you're where you would like to get to. So that awareness piece is, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, exactly. What are, what are the, you know, if you think about a reader taking something away, what are like the key, the key things that you would hope, um, whether it's information or outcomes from someone, you know, reading the book, what are, what are those key things that you would want folks to take away? One of the key things would be uh, the, the importance of communication and not just communication with others, uh, but communication with yourself. So how we talk to ourselves really shapes our world as well. If we tell, tell ourselves, you know, we're not good enough, we're not smart enough, um, you know, why does this happen to me all the time? That, that impacts you. So shifting that conversation with yourself uh, is extremely important. So that, that's, that's one of them. The other one is, uh, uh, you know, for me, my journey went from wanting to be better uh, at everything than at everybody, which, uh, you know, is a lonely journey, really. So when I, when I kind of figured out this, this methodology, uh, when I talk about empathy and awareness and, and all these things, it, a lot of it boils down to connection uh, and, and valuing connection with people because the way we can only get so far in our lives by ourselves. And I got to sort of a ceiling uh, and I realized that I, the way to like grow more and feel more fulfilled is to have more connection, uh, which have more empathy, have more understanding that, you know, just because I'm this way and I think this way doesn't mean somebody else has to think that way. We all have our unique gifts that we bring to the table. And what's unique is they're different, right? Yeah. Um, but I used to get frustrated. I used to think, you know, why doesn't everyone want to do these things I do? I want to do, you know, but now I realize, you know, when I built a team, uh, I can't have a team of people like me. I need a team of people that do things differently and have different talents, right? So it helps you appreciate also uh, the differences in people and, and their, their own, you know, the, the term I use is models of the world or how they, how they view the lens they look at the world with. Yeah. yeah. No, I think that's a great point to highlight, right? Not wanting to surround yourself with people that are just think and believe like you do, right? It's, <laughs> it's having, as you said, there's different skill sets, different ways of thinking. And, you know, if you're, especially if you're building a, a business, it's absolutely crucial to have those different skill sets to solve problems and everything else. Right. So, I mean, yeah. if you think about it from a security lens, right. There's, a lot of opportunity if someone only thinks about, you know, pen, penetration testing in one way and not looking at all these other facets, then you could have back doors or holes in your security. Um, exactly. Mm -hmm. 
Christian, can you can you talk a little bit about the the security piece? Because I think that this is really interesting and something that I know I'm guilty of as an early stage startup entrepreneur. But at what point should you care about security? When can you afford to? What should you be doing, um, especially in an early stage? But when you think about um, cybersecurity, like what are some of the best practices, things that entrepreneurs could implement um, based on your experience? So this is a this is a slippery slope here because <laughs> you know one of the things um, to keep keep in mind as an entrepreneur or anybody about security, uh, and I was just I had a discussion with someone about the same topic today uh, because there's a, a major breach of a, a cloud provider, for instance, uh, and these happen all the time. One of the things to consider is any data you you trust somebody else to secure uh, may be compromised at some point. You know, it, it's like you're telling a stranger, basically, which could be Dropbox or, or Google Drive, uh, all your secrets. And y- you should just assume that those secrets are going to be, you know, stolen by somebody else at some point in the world. So you be very cognizant of what, what you put out there. And, and the reality is we want to do our, our best to eliminate all risk, uh, but we, we can't eliminate risk. There's always going to be risk with cybersecurity. Uh, a few you know, tricks you can do or tips is to use a different password for all of your systems. A lot of people use the same password across every cloud provider or every yeah. system. And if one password is compromised, typically your username is your email address. So now someone has your email address and your password and they can try your email address and your password and all the systems they think you may have an account on. And they can do that with an automated bot or script. So if you have the same password and everything, now not only do they get into your Dropbox, they got into your bank, whatever else, right? Yeah. So make sure you use a different password, uh, turn on multi-factor authentication. Uh, that's something uh, good as well. But then also do your due diligence. If you're gonna put data with um, a cloud provider, make sure, you know, talk to them or find out how they're securing your data uh, and, and, and just you know, get a sense and do your research. Yeah. I think that's great. You know, simple things that we can implement. My, my thought though, when you said, you know, go talk to a cloud provider, if I don't know anything about security and could you, you could say almost anything and I would probably believe you. So how do I, how do I know what's, what's actually secure or not? <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's, that's the biggest challenge right there, right? It's an awareness piece. Yeah. Um, yeah, good point. Cause I could say, well, check if they're, if they have encryption, but then there's like 17 types of encryption, right? Yeah. So yeah, it is, it is, a, it is a very <laughs> challenging thing. Um, I don't have a good answer for that. Unfortunately, uh, you know, I would steer, steer away from a mom and pop type of, uh, cloud providers, you know, typically things like Google Dropbox, you know, if you look at their security page, they have a bunch of like accreditations there. Um, you know, they're SOC compliant, HIPAA compliant, these different things. Uh, so I would steer away from anything that's like a pretty new, uh, is, you know, if, if you're trying to minimize the risk, because it's pretty new, they probably haven't been compromised or, ha- or had enough attempts to compromise them to really dial in their security. Yeah. yeah. No, that's, that's good advice. So <laughs> unfortunately there's no like five point checklist for, for checking things. It's because it's, it, it can get pretty complicated. Absolutely. And things are changing very quickly too, as yeah. well. Right. So we start top- talking about different, yeah, different types of uh, technologies that are coming down the pike that might make every sort of s- semblance of security that you have now, when you start talking about like supercomputers and things like that, then good luck. So yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, Christian, going back to kind of the leadership piece, um, a good friend, Kyle Soderman, who's really involved in leadership. um, This is actually his question. What are some of those questions that you love to use in your meetings with others um, or yourself when you're talking internally to reshape thinking or um, essentially help get great results? Like what are those questions you like to use? I would group those into three buckets, really. Um, First off, you want to use what and how questions instead of a why question. If you ask a why question, like why are we in this scenario, it puts people on immediately on the defensive. So typically, as a general rule, use what or how. Uh, and what I would generally ask if we're trying to solve a problem or think a little bit differently, instead of saying, you know, what can we do about this, which is singular, ask, what are three things we can do 
that'll help us get a scenario. Most people are used to coming to one, but just by saying what are three, it, it alters how you're thinking. And, and sometimes you'll come up with a solution because if you just say one, you, you gravitate to the natural thing uh, that you typically gravitate to and your creativity sort of shut off. So I always ask like, you know, what are three or four or some number larger than one or two typically. Uh, the other thing I often do is, you know, we like to hear this term 10 X you know, we want to 10 X everything. Uh, and there's, there's some value to that mindset because if you say, okay, you know, today we're making whatever, $100,000 a month in revenue. What would it take if we needed to 10 times that uh, for, for like the next month? And just by shifting that thinking, you, it forces you to think bigger and think of scale and think of, you know, we have to go after these bigger clients, but it shifts you out of like your current uh, state of thinking into something larger, uh, which helps you come up with better solutions as well. Yeah. I like that. I like this a lot. So th those are all really great questions, I think. And, and I can see how together they're very, very powerful as well. Christian, how do you define success today? Like, what does that look like for you? Success to me is, is freedom. So it's freedom to do uh, the things I want to do, you know, when I want to do them, where I want to do them, who I want to do them with. Uh, that's my definition of success. Now, everybody you know, that, that society tries to give you a definition of success, but success is really a relative term. To me, I don't like to feel, you know, caged or, or trapped or, you know, forced into doing something. So I value freedom. And to me, that, that is success. Uh, and, and if you take like any uh, assessment profile, like if you take a DISC assessment or Enneagram, they'll give you some insight into, you know, what are your, what things you, you gravitate towards and what things uh, really irritate you. And that'll, that'll sort of a, should align with where you, how you view, you view success. Cause not everybody just wants tons of money and wants a, you know, a Ferrari and all this stuff, you know, some it's different for everybody. And we need to keep that in mind that the, the, the media and commercials and consumerism have tried to like make it out to be all this stuff you want to <laughs> buy, but there are plenty of people that have everything that are miserable. Right. So uh, that didn't, didn't work for everybody. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point, Christian. And I'm curious, you know, it sounds like you've delineated success from a, a monetary sense, right, of having accumulating a certain amount of wealth. So how would you how would you describe your relationship with money today? My relationship with money is a lot of peaks and valleys these days. <laughs> uh, when I was like when I was doing a, when I was doing freelance work, I uh, I was very you know, wealthy. I had money in, in the bank and no debt and all that. Uh, and then I started my business and I invested all my money into my business, like all of it. Uh, all my investments, you know, credit card debt, all went into my business. Uh, and then I sold my business. Uh, I sold my business for stock. So I didn't get like a big payout, uh, you know, up front, but I have potential to have, you know, a fair amount of money later on. Uh, but for me, it's, it's, it's not just about, you know, the money in my bank. It's really about, you know, how I feel. We talk about the feeling part uh, every day because I don't need the big car, you know, the fancy house, the big car, or any of that, or the nice car. Um, I just want to be able to travel and do the things like I defined as my, you know, success to me, right? Mm -hmm. So not feel trapped. Um, and that doesn't require a lot of money, but, you know, money does provide freedom as well to some degree. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's, yeah, it makes, makes a lot of sense. And those hills and valleys, as you said, um, seems to be a, a trend throughout uh, kind of the conversation. <laughs> yes. <an> absurd, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Christian, what would you say is the best investment you've made then? The best investment, uh, I would say two. One of them is the money I've invested in myself from a personal development standpoint, uh, you know, taking the time which is, you know, a cost and the money to go with like uh, the landmark forum or a Tony Robbins event, or, you know, join a mastermind that to me has been uh, money well spent yeah. uh, and, a, and a good investment because I believe if, if to, to, to attract more, we have to become more uh, and that, that could, you know, what we're attracting could be a number of different things it could be a better mate. It could be more money. 
Uh, it could be a better lifestyle, whatever, but we have to be something more to attract more. And a lot of people uh, expect more, but they don't evolve themselves. And I don't believe that's going to work. Um, the other, the other good investment I made was Amazon stock about 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I hope you're still holding that. So I uh, know I sold it to invest in my business, but I, I got went, it. Okay. Yeah. I wish I was still holding it, but <laughs> you know, I, I, I grew a lot by my business as well. No, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is interesting, Christian. So I've, um, I've got some friends that are very, very involved in the personal development space. And I've also got some friends that are very skeptical. I like tend to see my, I tend to see value in it. Yeah. Um, and like, I, I consume a lot of books and things like that. But when it comes to like, as you mentioned, some of these events, like a Tony Robbins, they're really expensive. How have you been able to weigh that and found, it sounds like you found value in them, but you know, if, if you're, you know, if you don't have a lot of money, how, how do you know that that's the right place for you to put your money? I know you, you know, you kind of mentioned if you want to attract more, you need to be more, but mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about that? Selfishly, I'm very curious. <laughs> it, it boils down to your priorities uh, and, and, not, you know, not, you know, like Tony Robbins, I think just had the, a virtual Unleash the Power Within event. I don't know how much it costs. It was probably like three or $400. Uh, so it may seem expensive, um, but it's expensive not to do it as well, the way I look at it. Because what do people spend their money on, right? The, the cable television, uh, a new car every couple of years, you know, are all those things that if you just take a step back and look at what you're spending your money on, uh, you know, uh, a nice watch, you know, whatever. All these things you're 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 spending money on going to get you to the next level you you you're trying to get to, or would that money be better spent uh, on developing yourself so you can attract more? Like I said, uh, so it's you know because a lot of people make the same argument to me. They're like, well, I don't want to spend, you know, I don't want to go to that event because it cost me so much, and they'll say that every year for like ten years. Um, but if they would have would have been to that event like ten years ago, their life probably would have shifted. And they would have more than uh, like made up for that amount they spent at the event and probably be further ahead on a lot of things and maybe change the entire trajectory of their life. You know, mm -hmm. uh, we, we tend to like put our, our value on, on possessions versus experiences. Uh, and I'm a believer that the experiences are what transforms us, not the possessions really. Yeah, no, I think that's a great way to explain it, Christian. And I, yeah, I, I appreciate you, uh, you kind of breaking that down. Yeah, no problem. Now, on the flip side, not all not all been good. I'm ass I'm assuming. What would you say is the dumbest money mistake that you've made? Buying my house uh, in Illinois in 2006. I think if you look at <laughs> uh, if you look at a chart, the very day the housing market peaked was probably the day I closed on that house. And I'm still. <laughs> It still is not even close to what I paid for it, like in value. So that was the, the worst mistake I made. Because everyone always says, you know, real estate, buy it, is always going to appreciate. That is not true. Uh, it, and it depends on where you buy it. It depends on a lot of factors we can't control. Uh, so that is not always true. So keep that in mind. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that's, a, that's a tough time, tough time to buy in hindsight. So. It was. But you never know. Now we know, but I didn't know then, you know. <laughs> yeah, but and who, who knows what will happen next year or two years from now. You never know. That's that right. could change. So <laughs> Exactly. Hopefully. <laughs> well, Christian, this has been, this has been a lot of fun. I really, really appreciate you sitting down and kind of sharing your experience um, I want to leave you with the last word. So if you could, you know, anything that you want to leave the audience with, and then also please let us know where we can get the book, um, how folks can connect with you if they want to connect with you outside of the podcast. Um, and yeah, just anything, uh, last word is yours. The last word uh, or parting advice would be to take risk and step outside of your comfort zone. Growth doesn't come from the status quo uh, and being in your comfort zone. And, and I think most of us want more, but we've become accustomed to this like umbrella of safety, but it's a, it's just, it's just something we've made up, you know, this, this umbrella of safety. So stepping out from under that umbrella and trying something new, uh, I think is uh, extremely important. People can get a hold of me uh, at christianespinoza.com, my website, and my book is available on Amazon and 
know, any other retailer. And my Audible book just came out a couple of days ago. So I'm excited about that. Awesome. Well, perfect. Well, this was a lot of fun, Christian. I really appreciate you sitting down and, you know, diving deep into your story and development and uh, imparting your wisdom on the audience. So thanks so much. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me, William. I appreciate it. That's it for today's episode of the Silicon Alley podcast featuring the Christian Espinoza. If you enjoyed today's episode, go ahead and share it with someone else that you think would get value. It's the only way that the community grows and others hear these incredible stories from entrepreneurs just like Christian. And if you haven't already, go ahead and pound that subscribe button so you get notified when episodes air every week. I'm William Glass, CEO and co-founder of Ostrich, and of course, your host of the Silicon Alley podcast. Have a very profitable day. You got no time to waste, but still you hesitate.